the NS8, a Kyoto animation podcast where we go through eight selected or curated works of the eponymous studio Kyoto Animation. And today we are covering Munto as we sort of hit the halfway point in our little odyssey. This is episode five. And as always, I'm joined by my co-host with the most most, Kai or Clear and Sweet. Hey, hey, exciting, exciting times when we're going back to 2003 to talk about one of Kyoto Animation's lesser known and less popular shows. So this one is going to be a fun one. But we have today also a uh, another guest on the podcast. Uh, Yada, who is it? Okay, so a little bit of background. Kai does all of the heavy lifting when it comes to guests. He literally had four of our six guests lined up for this, but I managed to scrape through with two guests. I knew two people. And one is here with us today. It is Tori or Animist Top Scholar from the Red Leaf Retro cast. And we have been long threatening a collaboration for about two and a half years, almost <laughs> as long as we've known each other. And it took Kyoto Animation, the power of Munto, to actualize this. So, uh, Tori, welcome to the cast. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, now this has, uh, I remember li- uh, airing the idea with you a long time ago. Maybe we should look to get something done, but. Jesus Christ, I'm terrible with collab ideas. <laughs> wait, 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 so so how did it take Munto to make it happen? Like, how was Munto the catalyst of all things? Well, yeah, that's the question, right? So uh, I had never collaborated with anyone before outside of, like, you know, the odd podcast appearance. But in terms of, like, the YouTube space or the Anitube space, never, never, never. And it took me and Yukai to finally get the ball rolling. And then I was right. like, well, look, the Band-Aid is off. I did it once. <laughs> and we're doing Monto, which is technically about as retro as it gets in terms of the um, Kyoto animation space. Like, I guess you could make a case for some of their in-betweening stuff they did early on. But like, this is literally yeah. Kyoto animation. It's on the tin. This is one of their works. Like, you go to Mal, this is there. You know, it's no, yep. it's, and uh, I thought, well, it's almost retro. For me, it, it actually feels incredibly <laughs> older than 19 years. And we'll get into that a little bit later on. So I thought there's only one man for the job. My good friend who loves all things retro. And here we are. That's so, probably the most interesting thing about this whole podcast, honestly. I don't know. The mm. unspeakable power of Munto is just uh, indescribable and something we will certainly get into over the course of this episode. But like, Tori, what's your what's your background with either Kyoto Animation or the, <laughs> the work of Munto? Uh, I have absolutely zero uh, background with Munto. I that heard about it before, basically, it's as far as I went with that. But, you know, as soon as Seata reached out to me for that, I was like, I mean, I guess this is the best it's going to be. Hey. <laughs> so, yeah. Nah. And uh, yeah. when it comes to Kyoto Animation, it's basically, how do I best describe this? Kyoto Animation, to me, is one of those studios that when I got into anime, because I got into anime relatively late, I got into anime in 2013. Kyoto Animation was almost that studio that, like, I always looked to because I knew, like, You could find some interesting stuff there, and their shows generally look pretty good, so that was that. And for me personally, Kyoto Animation sort of, it's got its ups and downs. It's got some shows I like, a lot of stuff I don't really care about, but yeah. That's kind of the interesting thing, too, is like a lot of what we would be talking about, or that's relevant about Munto, is kind of the evolution of Kyoto Animation as a studio. So you specifically coming from uh, this background of like, older anime right of retro anime or making that your bread and butter and your calling card having kyoto animation pop up you know kyoto animation a more recent studio you said by 2013 when you were getting into anime kyoto animation already had a reputation right there's already there's already clan ed and haruhi and, and even by that time nichijo and, and other shows K-On as well. oh yeah K-On too yeah of course going back we're going back to like the very beginning and uh, let's put the context here. 2003, Munto is kind of a movie length OVA made by Kyoto Animation. Then later in 2005, uh, they created another kind of sequel OVA of about the same length called Munto Beyond the Walls of Time, or as I like to call it, Munto 2, Revenge of Munto. Munto 2, uh, Electric Boogaloo. <laughs> yeah. So these... And then in later on in like 2009 or something, we're not talking about this specifically, but they remade the second OVA into a set of nine episodes, I believe. But it's kind of still the same story. So we're just originally talking about these two original OVAs from 2003 and 2005. And the Kyoto animation you would see in 2013 is not the Kyoto animation yet that you would see in 2003. A lot of the pieces are there, but it's different and it feels different even watching Munto 
Do you know what I was weirdly getting vibes of when I was watching it? It was like PA works around this time, <laughs> except for the fact that it said like literally Kyo Ani project as it enters. There was nothing Kyoto Animation, at least ostensibly in my mind, I could recognize, right? You know, yeah. with everything else, there's sort of like, a, at least everything we've done so far, you can sort of join the dots. I can see the line that went from Clan Ad to K-On, um, yeah. to K-On or, you know, Tamako, and then K on to Tamako Market. And yeah. it all sort of like works as this little net, this little web. And then there's Munto. Now, I would say like maybe later on, you could say like Viola Evergarden felt very standalone to me in a lot of respects compared to what sure. we had got pr- prior to that. But this one is like, it felt very OVA, right? Like if someone oh, said yeah. to me, this is like, oh, this is a, oh, this is actually a 90s OVA, you know, some Yakuza guys were laundering and they had to hide, you know, their like receipts somewhere. So they just made Munto uh, <laughs> or like the guys that made Lodos, record of Lodos yeah, or like, sure, oh, we want to do sure. something else. You know, it's, it's a sort fantasy. of weird sort of portal fantasy. And we got Munto. So full disclosure, I think none of us had really uh, experienced Munto until sort of semi recently. Wouldn't that be correct? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I watched it about six months ago. Yeah. And you just have to talk about it six months later. <laughs> <laughs> it's wild, though. I, I, I mean, it's really fun to, and we will in the next episode with Myriad Colors Phantom World just shit on something, right? And it's also very fun in, like, go watch the Hebe K Euphonium episode where we just, there's just so much to praise and it's very easy to just say how good things are. Munto is is a weird one to me because there's, like, clearly really bad stuff in this in this. OV, these two OVAs. But then at the same time, you're kind of like, okay, maybe maybe something there is a little interesting or could have been there. Yeah. Uh, I, was, I was trying to like work an analogy on it. And the way I would think of it was sort of like a hot pot where you have all of these ingredients that you sort of just bring together and you just dump it in a soup and you cook it up, right? So yeah. mileage with hot pot will vary wildly depending on like the weather, essentially. Like I'm good for one hot pot a year where I can sort of like stomach it. But I like the ingredients, right? I like what goes into it because I brought those ingredients to the table. And I feel like with Monto, as like the whole finished thing, I would say that I didn't necessarily enjoy or I wouldn't necessarily say it was good. But there sure. were elements that I was like, no, that's actually a pretty good moment, right? And it, right. I was sort of like breaking it down to like the little pieces. There was a lot that I liked. Now, yeah. I would say this. I thought the second one, uh, Munto Strikes Back. Is that what we're going with? Or Revenge of Munto? <laughs> <laughs> uh, too Munto, too furious, too, too angsty, <laughs> yes. I guess. Yeah. And Munto is a uh, I thought the animation of that one was pretty stellar in parts. Mm. The first one felt like... Mm. It's I, raw. I def- <laughs> it's very it raw. raw. I mean, that's I, interesting, I, though, because it goes to show how much things changed over like two years yes i think I mean, the crazy have... thing is we're like two years away from clan ad right like to put this in sort of context of what we've done in the show like by 2005 we're like literally it's what 2007 we have clan ad right you have ova1 and that is uh right around the first fumofu and then uh there's the second second 12 episodes of fumofu and uh air and then you're into ova2 and then you're into like Haruhi and and uh, Can- Clan Canon and, and Clan on. Canon, yeah. Here's the thing, though. I was thinking of like a good challenge for Munto. Hey, explain to someone the plot of Munto. <laughs> Because, <laughs> that's, because, what, that's what I want to do. I want to do that right now. Absolutely. So please, if you can, or if Tori, you can, I, man, I cannot. <laughs> And oh, I will admit defeat straight ahead. What's his name? Judd Apatow has this thing, story and plot. Plot is what sort of you think you want and story is what you need. If you think of that in terms of like a sort of an emotional punch of story being emotional and plot, what happens to get to that emotional sort of punch sure, or whatever. Sure. I would say this is literally just like slathered with plot, like butter on, you know, on like pancakes. And the story just never arrived. Like <laughs> yes. I had so many, I, I had so many questions and I assumed I would get answers in the second part. I was like, okay, here's my big yeah. question. Why is this girl so goddamn special? Like what makes her like <laughs> that <laughs> reservoir of power? And I'm just waiting for it and waiting for it. And then the ending was, oh my, anyway. Okay, yeah, okay. time out, time out. We, we, we uh, there's a lot to say, but uh, <laughs> we have to give the people, because I expect that people listening to this podcast may have not actually seen Munto, you know, to their detriment. That's their <laughs> that's their deal that they have to work through. Tori, can you just like literally describe what goes on in these episodes? I mean, like <laughs> it kind of feels uh kind of feels a little bit weird. You're gonna kind of get thrown into it a little bit. Stuff is uh falling from the sky. Giant pillars are just being brought down. Yeah, there's a separate a, world, right? There's like a yeah. mage world or, mage or world. It's just, that's, that's apparently in the future. It's a yeah, yeah, it's it beyond time, exist. but it's in the <laughs> air and things are falling down to earth, but it's not because it's like, there because 
I don't know. There's like world building, right? Like there's a whole like political structure of this mage world from the future or like in the yeah. sky. And there's like all these factions and these, these characters that we don't know. And there's this, of course, there's a council of elders or some shit that they talk about. <laughs> oh no, the man is running out and the world's collapsing. And, and then the conceit of Munto is that their mage world is ending. And the only person who is able to undo this destruction of their world is this random ass high school girl, Yumemi. And Yumemi, again, has this mysterious power. So Munto, the the character, the eponymous character here is, I think, the king, right? Yeah, he's the king. Hmm. And he he takes it upon himself to use whatever power he has to forcibly go down to the human world and like ghost Yumemi like literally haunt her and 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 she can't really see him but she kind of sees the mage world and she can kind of she looks up at the sky a lot and to make this more complicated how he got there we found in the second movie was that basically he had to sort of like defy the laws of the universe as governed by this other character gas is that our Gus? <laughs> yeah, Gus. <laughs> Gus. I was I was literally waiting because he is so like he I he is so signposted as a villain in my mind. I was just like waiting the whole time for the right. in the first movie for him to like do something. You know, right? Like he's he was, built like, up to be all powerful. He's got these tattoos. He's got a big fight scene, and he's like he kind of uh, has this back and forth with Munto, and then I. I don't know. I yeah, he's got villain flags, but I kind of read him as like gay for for Munto and Munto as as I literally uh, I I I could barely read a thing off of these characters. They were like <laughs> yeah. there. Um I will say that so to like be even more sort of specific, uh Munto is like the king of like one particular like area in this um oh, really? future world. <laughs> yeah, he's like the king of like the magical kingdom, we'll say. But there are other kingdoms mm-hmm. who have basically outlawed the use of this sort of magical. I guess it's like mana would be what the the common term across like other IP would be, where essentially what's happening is um, they kind of like early on in their sort of uh, evolutionary history, we'll say a lot of this like these races were like gorging themselves on mana, and there was sort of a cautionary tale where they said no, we're actually destroying the world by using it too much, and the last remaining kingdom that was still using it was um munto's kingdom. munto's kingdom now this yeah. all sounds i thought semi-interesting in terms of like so, a early old school fantasy but how this was delivered was actually staggering because we were making jokes <laughs> in the previous episodes about like oh we really love shinze Kayori, but the exposition horse is like <laughs> we didn't even get a horse here it was like you would have like people just talking over fight scenes and it's i was so like weird. i literally had to i had to like go back and listen to it again because i was watch. i would make the mistake of actually watching what was happening on the screen as opposed <laughs> to listening to these myriad voices that were just coming at you with fucking lore every like, et- like the first 10 minutes was staggering like it was almost yeah. like a parody like how yeah. much information yeah. they were fucking shoving yeah. at us like because yeah. you know we had this thing about clan and we we're like oh maybe if it could have been shorter and like this one is so obviously wanted to be longer. And that's why yeah. probably they made a longer series of it later on. But God, they bet us over the head with it. Like after a minute, I was like, yeah, this shouldn't be an OVA. This needs to be a fucking shonen or like, you yeah. know, a, a three part movie directed by Peter Jackson. Like there was absurd like, amounts of world building just being it's fucking so thrown at us. It's like you're having like visual exposition. You're having fucking oral exposition. And they're not like they're literally contradictory. You know, it's like <laughs> yeah. one oh, guy's yeah. over one guy's over here playing jazz and the other guy's on fucking break beats, you know, and it was just like or like blast beats or whatever. And it was just like I was it, it's staggered like how it, fucking much plot they were giving us. Definitely. And that's like that's a thing for me too. That's like that's a trigger for me. That that like gets me. If if you sit there and exposit at me, that kills me. I don't know about you, Tori. But. Yeah, no, it definitely does. But I mean, like, the thing with this show as well is that it does a little bit of both. Because, like, for the same thing, when Munto goes through time or whatever and comes down and appears before you and me, he does the exact opposite thing very often where he just shows up and be like, you need to come with me. Why? Bitch. No time to explain. Come. Just come. <laughs> just join me. That's How it. do I join I was... you? What do you mean? Yeah. <laughs> she's like, she's literally like, Nani? <laughs> 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 Now, I will say, actually, she didn't say Nani in my one, because I, for the life of me, could not find the 
the sub version of this so i had to watch oh. the dub so, so um imagine oh, if you're gonna if you're gonna break that open right now, that's a that's a whole cookie. Okay, go I, had, I had Goku basically saying this to me. <laughs> yeah, that's what, that's what I want to say. Okay, so for context, uh, the voice of King Munto is uh, Sean Schemmel, right? That's the voice of it, literally the English voice of Goku, the thing he's most known for, and he's just doing the Goku voice. Yeah, it's not and even the, like this, it's not even disguise. Yep, the voice for Yumemi is uh, Veronica Taylor, who, uh, as you may know, is the voice of Ash Ketchum in the beginning, or if you are a cool person the voice of akari from aria the animation i'm not a cool person the, not no, yet ash no. catch him i was literally just like running through the theme song in my head <laughs> yeah and they do they do a good performance for the most part i don't know or the the, the dub is generally good considering you know? how how bad dubs could be at this period oh, totally. um or like how phoned in we'll say because like there's a lot of good dubs from this time um i always like go back to i really like the fruit basket dub which must have been around the original fruit basket dub must have been around this time as well because you know you always have the same like four actors doing everything anyway yep, yep. and it's usually like not the main cast it's sort of like the supporting cast right. where you're like her mom for example could literally be like a dude right yeah or yeah, just somebody um, off the street you're yeah. like oh, uh okay what's her name again homu lily no non lily the, no. the witch from madoka magica <laughs> no the name with the main girl the main girl um Oh, uh, you, uh, Umemi, Umemi. Umemi, yeah. Like, yeah, I, yeah, I, th- I thought she did, like, I think the, the VA, at least what we were getting in the dub. Did you watch the dub as well? I watched the dub, yes, Tori. I don't know about you. No, I uh, I watched the sub. I am I, uh, not really a dub watcher, so. I, I didn't want to. Well, I, I didn't want to, like, I'm not, I, 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 I kind of bounced between the two of them. But for this one, I was like, I was like, oh, 2003 OVA. There's no way there's going to be a dub of this one. Turns out. In my world, there was no way there's going to be a sub of this one because all I could find was the dub. There's like a really, really low res version on YouTube, actually. We should maybe link that so people, if they want to watch, like it in glorious 150p or whatever it is. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Anime was different back in the day, man. Yeah. And it's got that beautiful 3.4 ask, uh, 3.4 aspect ratio as well. It's like, mm-hmm. you know, that's, that's like that old school. It's not uploaded in three parts. So it's not like quite the quintessential classic anime youtube experience <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's pretty close <laughs> okay uh a lot to say about Bunto here uh i want to go back to something that we've done in every episode of this podcast so far that i've neglected to do right now and this ties into all the writing that we were talking about and, you know, the the place Munto occupied in Kyoto Animation and the space. So w- in every episode, we've kind of introduced some of the staff behind it. And f- the reason I watched Munto in the first place was because of the one person who was almost entirely in charge of this. They wrote this show. They animated most of it. And they did all the storyboards and directing as well. And that person is Yoshiji Kigami. Yoshiji Kigami, uh, probably more known now to you or to anyone who's a fan of Kyoto Animation as an animator. Um, he did animation on Grave of the Fireflies, Akira. Um, in, in Kyoto Animation world, he's more responsible for things like uh, that big that big fight scene where Violet kicks all those dudes in Violet Evergarden. Or um, we've mentioned him before in the Hibik Euphonium episode where he did uh, uh, running across the bridge and crying that whole thing. And I believe I credited or I looked into this. I tried to see what he did in Disappearance of Haruhi Suzumiya. And I believe he did the scene with Kyon running. So like anytime anybody had to do running or like a big fight scene, Kigami was like the go-to guy for Kyoto Animation. This is the only thing he directed. They had him direct. Wrote, yes, exactly. And and like he wrote this too. Like this is all his fan fiction. <laughs> so the all of you can see so much with just that fact, right? Like so much of like why does this story make no sense? What is happening here? Uh and also like why did, you know, Ishihara and and um the other the others came in to kind of make Kyoto animation or take the reins on directing in Kyoto animation. Why didn't Kigami? You know, and I think you can kind of see it when you watch Munto, right? Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah. Yes, you can. It's one of those things where you, like, you have this prodigiously talented animator, but he really has to get this out of his system. And you're yes. like, okay, we've got to be. So it's like it's like um, you know, I I I, know, I can't really speak from experience in this, but like you know, dad wants to buy a sports car because he's just going through stuff. So you kind of just have to hu- you have to just humor him until he sort of like catches a look of himself in the mirror and realizes a uh, big mistake. You know, he just had to get yeah. out of his system. He had to try, and I admire the yeah. efforts. Um, I do. I I respect stuff like this because, like, I mean, on our podcast, we've talked about something similar with uh, was it Twinkle Nora Rock Me, just like an eighty Soviet, which is literally the same thing as a sequel, technically to Nora, but the uh, same same thing, pretty much. Stunned by one dude, pretty much entirely. It looks like absolute garbage. It's barely animated. Like literally, there's to say that it's only animated in keyframes is giving it too much credit. It isn't, but um, it looks like garbage. But you know, it's literally the same thing. He apparently was very much into the character, and he refused to let it go. So he did another one. <laughs> and and that's that's the other thing too. Like you're a nascent Kyoto Animation, right? You don't have anything to your name in 2003 and who knows if this project is going to be successful or at all and you're like man if we can get a hit if we can get one ip out in the books and if we can get like (laughs) you know like studio trigger forming and get and being like let's make kill a kill then we got then we got something to our name right and uh and i think that like the that's the intent too here like we're gonna let you go kigami we know you can animate and and we're going to – if this hits, then we can make it a thing. And it can grow the studio based off the success of Munto. Um, the last thing I'll say before we kind of move off uh, Kigami is that Kigami was one of the people who passed away in the Kyoto Animation arson attack. So if you'd like to remember him in some way, then Munto is the place to go for that. And like I guess – can we do like some praise for the – for it right now just because i figure like, it's very oh, yeah. easy to go That's negative it. on it because uh, there actually are things that i i did like um i thought the character design was actually quite cool um yeah. it gave me sort of again i mentioned it, or i don't know if i mentioned it on the cast or off cast we were talking about it gave me record of lotus war vibes where ostensibly that's not very it's not a very good ova but it's sort of like it's uh it's a very specific kind of brand of like old school fantasy that i just really like and that was the reason i was sort of semi excited about going into Munto is because I'm appro- not really approaching it from an anime pers- fan's perspective. It was more so like a fantasy kind of uh, junkie's perspective. So um, I liked the the character design because it reminded me of like, again, of not everybody, but there were certain uh, characters that looked a lot like they kind of wandered off of Lotus War, especially like the Dark Elves because they had that sort of pointed ears. And when you had the council scene, the, the sort of, I don't want to say he's an antagonist as such because... <laughs> I honestly yeah, didn't really know, yeah. <laughs> but he had this sort of like shadowy, sort of like menacing sort of vibe. Uh, I thought he was very well designed. I thought Monto looked pretty cool as well. Like very yeah. aged. Like you would never see a character design like that in 2022. It's he so looks like fucking Shadow the Hedgehog, man. Yeah. <laughs> with the spiky hair yeah. and the edge. He's. I, I was thinking like maybe like you know Bastard the. Um, Netflix recently released Bastard. And it's like for, like it's oh, like yeah, 80s. Yeah. So it's very heavy metal. It's very 80s. Mm-hmm. It's yeah. very like camp. And that's like a yeah. lot of what the uh, the character design from the sort of like fantastical perspective is. Um, I thought it, I thought it worked. And again, there were some really cool sequences uh, when they let themselves go. Like it was very um, sparing, we'll say. Like you could yeah. tell that they, you know, it was a bit of a they were sort of patched together. Now in in, in the second movie, I thought there was a really cool sequence where um, Gus or whatever he was called, the um, yeah. the dark elf. Um, he was sort of like fighting a, a, a fleet of battleships by himself. And he just yes, sort of I was like, going to bring that one up. I was yep. like, Ooh, this and is really tattoos. well shot. And then there was yeah. a, another, this was like a, some, sh- some shot composition was quite nice as well. Like I, I remember like at one point he's going, Whoa, that's a really good <laughs> shot. It was when, <laughs> um, uh, I can't, I forgot her name again. Uh, you met, Har- Har- yeah, you met me was like looking at the wreckage of a, uh, a, a Ferris wheel. And it was like an mm-hmm. extreme yep. wide shot pulled out she was in like the foreground and you had this massive like ghost of what was this ferris wheel uh, just like looming over her like some sort of like fallen titan and i was like holy fuck that's a really good shot and then you know and then um this was like the last 10 minutes of the second movie so i was like so checked out by this point anyway and that scene literally said whoa beautiful so 
You know, I I, I want to say that when I got done watching it, I I had the same impression. I'm not an action guy. I'm not a I'm not a you know um, Sakuga nerd or anything. But I do respect those fight scenes when the um what is, they, there's like this character that they fight against. I think Gus fights against. That's the um. She's the commander of the other oh. faction of the elves. Yes, and the, like skimpy, her- skimpy, white-haired. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And that whole that whole battle thing uh, that's really cool. Yeah, I, it, uh, you Lis- could see Lisa. How- Lisa. Oh, okay, there you go. There you go. I, I, My I, I see, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, then the other thing I said after watching this w- with my friends was there were some good composition. There were some good directing. There was okay. Uh, some interesting stuff going on with uh, how Kigami, because he did all the boards for this, decided to portray some things. And and there it, it gets weird in some parts too with like the pacing, you know? There's straight up exposition dump that is atrocious. And this like world building that needs to be done that is just never done. And, and it's so confusing. Um, but then at the same time, there's shots of like when Yumemi's in her loft bed and the thing and all, and, and this kind of like quiet moment um, that you do kind of, you do kind of like get that impression. You do kind of feel like, okay, what's going on here? What, the, you know? Yeah. Mm. There was yeah, one I beautiful shot of uh, Yumemi in the second, in the second OVA where she was just sort of like looking, I think she might've had her head on a desk or something like that. And I remember just being caught again. It was like that fairground shot where I was just like, where the hell did that come from? You know, it was just like, <laughs> yes, so, like it was literally like, cause I don't know if it's like, you know, by contrast, everything looks way better, you know, because you're like, you're sort of like sandwiched by sh- not shit, but like yeah. something that's of a significantly <laughs> lower quality. And it totally. was, just, it was these moments. Where I was like, wow, there's like so much potential here. And that's kind of like what, you know, you think about that sort of like divergent timeline, you know, we're like, Oh, we're on, we're on sort of like timeline a where, Haruhi was the thing that blew up, right? Yeah, and then you see yep. like these little moments of like, mm, well, that could have been, you know, yes. they kind of like nuance that a little bit, and who knows, right? It could have been exactly. Something. It might have been something in another universe. Munto is huge, <laughs> and boy, uh, that's wild to even think about. Yeah, Can you imagine like the the uh, the kind of like quirky ed that Munto would have put together of all like the little. <laughs> All that kind of like TV elf characters that are doing like their, you know, like doing their dance. Like, uh, oh yeah. yeah. Uh, I want to. I want to say that it, while we're talking about positives, I particularly love the character of Ichiko. Ichiko is Yumemi's friend, and also probably uh, she's probably hot for Yumemi, uh, or at least I read it that way. She is uh, notices that Yumemi is looking up at the sky a lot. Notices that Yumemi has this like thing going on. Yumemi does not tell her, and she wants to be Yumemi's confidant. And since she can't see Ghost Space World, Munto is not haunting her. She, that creates a lot of angst, and I think some of the best moments or like really the only character thing that is at all going on in Munto um, is that Ichiko uh, feels feels put off and rejected by Yumemi uh, even mm-hmm. until like the end of the, the second OVA. Yeah. It's yeah. Like a, a thing. Definitely. Tori, Tori, you got I mean, anything nice to say about Munto? I mean, just to kind of uh, go off on that as well with uh, Ichiko, it's just like, it also kind of gave room for one of those scenes was like probably the only time i could remember like laughing at the something they did in the show as well the scene where she is like really frustrated and goes home and she kind of just screams out in the room and the entire the street just that, gathers oh, that's outside so good. yeah that's so i love good. that yeah oh, that actually that actually made me laugh i wasn't expecting that that was such a heartfelt moment where it was just like ah everybody's yep. so close here <laughs> yeah uh, uh, people seem I, like I, they care i also really liked ichiko's fit when they went for a picnic thought she was kind yeah. of swagged out you know and also oh, I, I would say this main girl had this like cruel white dress as well and i was like oh they're kind of you know and mini me had her whatever the hell she was doing oh, you know okay so we have to bring up the character of suzume because maybe this transitions into stuff that's not so good uh suzume is this very small character uh she's in she's the same age as ichiko and you maybe she's a classmate ostensibly right i don't know she looks like she's 10 years old but 
and you know whatever <laughs> uh she like a large part of the plot that we have not discussed uh completely removed from the magic world nonsense is that suzume gets married and then, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and if by married we mean tries to swim a river with her fiance and it was I, it was fucking wild yeah, I I, I, <laughs> i'm trying to remember why they did this and i do not remember why they did this so i think they sort of like or at least um, our heroine sort of like read it as this thing of like moving forward into the future. I think it was sort of like a pseudo, like we do this big, like almost like a cleansing thing to show that we're sort of like leaving behind the, the like the traumas or whatever of the past, which so- Susan May never really struck me as a, you know, carrying a lot of trauma kind of type, <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. but you know, so they had to. She, had, she literally, like, oh my god, like she. I kind of hated her, but she was also fucking adorable when she had that like rubber date, like the rubber, like <laughs> she was a floaty, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, like, so, so uh, it's metaphorical in the show, right? Like, it's like it's. It, it's yeah, it's it's thematic, right? That they're moving forward with their new life. They swim kind of a river. That them, they're giving themselves up to the the like because she it needs seemed to like a up, suicide, right? right? Didn't it seem like a double oh, suicide? Oh my god, I was oh, yeah. I didn't know there was another side at the beginning. I was like, okay. oh shit, ritual suicide. Didn't see that coming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's got dark. <laughs> yeah. But no, it is it is thematic in like it ties into very very loosely into Yumemi's story about. Um, you know, believing in the unknown and, and, you know, just jumping in quite literally with, you know, two feet and, and, and going for it and like believing in the future or something like that. And, and that gives you Memi the strength to uh, accept ghost Munto haunting her in her head and believe in that. Uh, but like textually on that like first level of what's happening in the show there's a bridge over this river and everybody's watching them swim <laughs> this river and there, there's no reason for them to swim the river to elope like they could you know it's not like a toradora thing you know where they where they in the river and it's it just it's like no they just go for a swim in the river because they feel they need to I'm like what yeah and i love the fact that the guy wasn't even like he never showed up in the second movie whatsoever I was, yeah. like, I was like, like, because I was like, that was such a big part of the first one, and it took to like forty eight minutes into the OVA for them to sort of mention that uh, the girl had, uh, Susan had been to this park before with her boyfriend slash husband slash whatever. Also, I don't know why. Why did you have to make him so tall? It just automatically made it creepy, <laughs> you know? Because like, even though ostensibly they're sort of supposed to be the same age, he is like a man. And she, yeah, she's Susan is like three foot six. She's, oh she God. is small. Mm. She's tiny. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, and she's like, you know, she's not like quirky, kind of small. You know what oh, I mean? No. Like, yeah. it's, you know, she's sort of like, no, you are like, you're really nine though, right? Like, yeah. that's what we're, yeah, that's yeah, what we're going about right. your age. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she, she was a funny character, man. Like, and I don't mean she's funny and like, ha ha ha, isn't she so hilarious? As in, like, like why are you actually here? Because yeah. Ichi- because Ichigo does all the heavy lifting in terms of like in okay in no in movie one I thought Ichigo was basically the uh, hey wake up from yeah. you yeah. know but in the second one she had like she did actually kind of she was sort of MVP right like she yeah. sort of did all yeah. the heavy lifting um but Susan B was sort of like okay yeah she's getting married uh, <laughs> and you know because she like she never had like a moment of like oh why are these three friends so good. You know, like it's like, yeah, right. Ichigo right. and, right. you know. Yeah, yeah. The, in, in terms of character dynamics, um, you have that Ichigo thing. But then that's 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 it. There's like, there's again, there's it goes back to there's no idea why Yumemi is special in any way or no reason behind it. And then there's no reason for Suzume and her nonsense to be in this show. And you got to think, you got to think of like, Kikami, what were you going for? Like when you're sitting down in that writing room and you're in, and you're trying to sell a, this young Kyoto animation on or tell everybody about the story, and you're like, yeah, then she swims a river, and you're like, what? Why did you put this character in the show? Why? Why are you choosing to animate this? Uh, it's it was, wild. 
It was like some of the decision making because it's. I also kind of felt like they maybe over overly focused on the um the real world, you know. Yeah. Mm. It's like because there was so much like uh, there was a bit in the set in a in season season two in OVA two. Um, where they were sort of going through all of the different factions that were sort of like uprising. You were getting this like world history report in like <laughs> yeah. seven yep. seconds. And I was like, shit, again, I go back to the character design. A lot of interesting like characters were appearing before me. There was a sort of like Princess Mononoke tribal swole dude that was I sort of like... I don't even remember that. Yeah, he I was, do not was, even remember that. It was, a bit of a, it was a bit of a flub in terms of like world building in terms like aesthetically because he was very like tribal looking, right? He was wearing furs and... But he's also the guy who's leading the rocket ships right yeah. it's like mm, you know i feel like some sort of like retro futuristic sort of like onesie might have been better something you know polyester and shiny as opposed to this sort of like earthy thing that he had going on but yeah. and that, but they had like oh you know this kid this the the shaman king of blah blah blue is rising up against the you yeah. know the 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 pig men of far and <laughs> like we're getting these like one shots it's like oh all right, I'm looking forward to finding out more so, about this, you know? There's a big have, battle. And it was like, at this time, the, like all the best animation was front-loaded. So you were like, ex- like, oh, we're getting some good fight sequences. Like, uh, the visuals are looking pretty good. We're kind of building up a... My, my impression was that uh, our girl... Um, you met God, me. You met you me. Was, met I don't me. know why this is like my fucking white whale. I can't say her name. Was going to come to their world and we were going to have right. a sort of set there, you know? Because the first one was sort of set kind of halfway between both but yeah that's what i was hoping you know we would spend more time in the fantasy world and figure out what the hell was going on oh, oh totally like she's going to be isekai and then the, it's going to be that and i think that's the promise of munto or like that's what would have happened in that alternate universe where munto hit and then you know Kyoto animation had the funds to go heavy on it and you know selling figures and got a card game adaptation and everything like that would have been or like Escaflone, right? Or something yeah. like that, you know? Then that would be the promise fulfilled by Munto. Or, or I have another reference for you too, or, or two two other references. Tell me if you've seen either of these, Tori or Yada. Uh, Tenshi Muyo. Not really, no. The, no, no Tori? I, no, I have I a girlfriend that. watching one, and I would like Tori, you do, a retro, you, you do a retro like, podcast, you haven't seen Tenshi Muyo? Listen, there's a lot of stuff I haven't seen, all right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all right. All right. Tenshi Muyo has the same type of like world building stuff. There's a whole intergalactic nonsense and it's used a couple times, but they do the opposite. It's like they mention the kingdom of Jirai maybe a couple times and then the tree in passing. And then the rest of it's just the harem hijinks stuff and on, on, on earth. And I think I see so much of Tenshi Muyo in, uh, Munto specifically because it was late nineties and, and it would probably be a huge reference and influence onto this. And it, it, it does have that kind of fantasy coming into the world and it looks very similar. Like Munto kind of looks like, uh, Ryoko's hair. Um, do like all that, like the shock of spikes, right? Oh yeah, 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 totally. And even just the way the, the animation goes in a lot of it. Yeah. I, I would say that's for the end of the episode where we do our references. That's my pick. Uh, Tenshi Muyo. Uh, the other reference I have to give to you, and tell me if you've experienced this, is a RPG for the Game Boy Advance called Golden Sun. Jesus Christ, dude. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever played that either. I've never, of you. Even, I've never even held no. a Game Boy Advance. Really? Oh, <laughs> fuck, guys. Come on. All right. For the viewers out there who there are more people probably know Golden Sun than they do fucking Munto. Anyway, it has the same exact plot. And it, it so and it's from the same around the same time period, right? It says 2001, uh, the world's ending, right? Because people alchemy was sealed away and now the world is crumbling and, and it's like a whole thing. And there's this it, it does take place all in this fantasy world. Like there's no real world. So they spend Golden Sun's notorious for the first hour of gameplay is just world building and like the village that these protagonists grew up in and how it relates to the concept of alchemy and the sealed towers. And you like you're saying all this, you know, plot or world building and kind of delivering it in a in a natural way and setting it up the events of the story. So I feel that Munto he split the difference and ended up worse for it on both ends of this. It didn't go Golden Sun. It didn't go Tenshi Muyo. And uh, it 
in it kind of like presents as it wants to be either of these and then just doesn't really either i got you know? a, i got a, like a munto esque sort of like reference to tie this sort of analogy together on one bank of this river we have golden <laughs> <laughs> and on the other bank we have tenchi muyo and in in this in this instance munto is Su- uh, in the <laughs> she, it's it's our young lovers just not making it across the river and drowning somewhere in the middle yeah <laughs> exactly yes that's very good thank you thank you for that oh man do you, uh, do you, uh, uh, you know what's another part that i felt like woefully dated in is like the so this was sort of like a weird period in time in terms of like fantasy um because we we're like a few years off like what would be like log horizon be a, for, for a big changer in sort of like and like she's still we're four years off of um shinse kayori right but in terms of like how fantasy anime which is like a big sort of subsection of anime especially with isekai how woefully dated that felt in terms of like this is not really the kind of fantasy that people wanted anymore this yeah. was like this is this is like like yeah. this is not a million miles away from fucking um the never ending story. <laughs> yeah, sure, <laughs> you know what sure. I mean? And it's like sure, that's like this is something like this is something like eighties. If this was I think if this was an OVA in the eighties and they had like yeah. four episodes to do. It was four. Yeah. I think that this yeah. could have been like, oh actually this is one of those OG uh OVAs yeah. that you need to watch. This is just sort of like really out of time for me (laughs) you you got there because that's the title that's the title of the the thing i might have been sitting on that one for like how long have we been going (laughs) (laughs) yeah 43 minutes so we got there i literally i my notes are like i gotta get this i gotta get this reference and now i didn't want you know to like reveal the curtain i was gonna go look how wishy i am that came off the dome it it was (laughs) it was planned (laughs) but it does it truthfully feels really out of time like i don't know what the fuck they were in terms of like other than the fact that it's sort of like you're humoring uh, the creator, right? Uh, right. I can't right. understand like why someone thought like this is the kind of story that's going to resonate with audiences in yeah, 2003. It, and and it, maybe that's it. Maybe maybe Kigami was too influenced by those types of 80s OVAs. And and yeah, mm-hmm. if this predated Tenshi Muyo instead of being after it, maybe there's something there, like you said. But generally, I think, I don't know. It's not like storytell yeah like anime right is in a different place in 2003 but storytelling is not and i think that any type of writer you know if you got anybody in here to just look at what you have planned out for the story they would they would just take the pen and the red pen and just go to town on it like what the fuck is this suzume stuff get that (laughs) out of here you know i don't know how would you improve munto tori I mean, like the thing that I, the sort of impression that I get, right, is that I feel like it is, like you said, it is very much inspired by the 80s style of OVA. And I feel like I can see that being the case, right? When you write the story for this, writing it out and whatnot, just not tying it to a, what would be at the time in 2003, a single OVA. Um, it, it can, you can come up with some quite interesting things. Then you have the idea that you are going to have to show this to people and you are going to have to show yourself well, like show what you can do. You have you're trying to show what QNE is capable of in a single episode. That is not very easy. So yeah. the story takes a the story then takes a lot of hits. Stuff gets shuffled around. Some weird priorities get put in there for some reason, like the relationship, the swimming scene, stuff like that. It doesn't feel that connected, and not as connected as it should be. And then at the end of the day, you sort of come up with what you see in a lot of. Uh, in a lot of especially the 80s OVAs technically they look very good they have a lot of stuff going for it production values there you can definitely you can definitely see why they were allowed to make this after that however if you're going to go through it and like look at it critically you're going to analyze the story you're going to look at the stuff you're going to be like okay this definitely needs some work and then of course in 2005 you see the second OVA come out and uh, there has definitely been some technical improvements and even slight story improvements, I say, I'd say I feel like the second OVA is a little bit more focused than the first one is. There's definitely uh, improvement there, and then, but even still, you kind of come up with the same thing. It's like maybe it would have been better for, as a series, but I don't know. I kind of, without knowing anything, of course, it kind of feels to me like it is the sort of typical OVA style. Where it's like this is a showpiece. We're yeah. gonna show what we can do, <laughs> not yeah. necessarily in terms of story writing, but we're gonna show what we're capable of. I got. I got such a proof of concept vibe off of this. 
Like I was yes. like, you know, you go. So here's here is this is like my uh, Spark Notes version. And what I'm going to do is when you say it's OK, I'm going to flesh all of this out into this like big ass, you know, yeah. sweeping, maybe 25 episode epic, you know, uh, <laughs> yo, yo. just write but, the check. Uh, so yeah. I, I on the improving it. Right. Here's 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 how I think you do it. Right. I think you, okay, now, as, okay. and I, you know, my favorite part of the world theoretically is this um, future out of time in time fantasy magical land. I uh-huh. think you I think you cut it out completely of the first one. Right. And you just have Monto appearing to her. And you have the preface of her sort of like, she sees the shit in the sky, right? That's right, 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 that's right, like right. you open on that like the same way she does, right? I actually right. like that was cool. The fact she was carrying the umbrella and the way they tied that around. And the fact that when it's cloudy, she saves the sky the same way as everyone else does because the islands are hidden, right? That's cool. Yeah. That's what yeah. you call like fucking character stuff right there. And you just play into that, right? And then Monto is sort of like, he starts to appear to her. And he does a better job of explaining himself because like, it's fucking <laughs> yeah. infuriating. The third time he said, refer to me as King Munto. Like, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, but tell the, there's, her. There's no relationship between you, Memi, and Munto. That's like, there's no relationship <laughs> uh, yeah, at so, all. So I think if he basically, and she, she has to get Isekai'd. At least partially, yeah. right? So, like, to yeah. just because then you, when she's there, now she's like, uh, she's Harry Potter at Hogwarts, right? She has got like no reference, just like we have no reference for what the fuck is going on, but she can right. experience it. So, we don't need to be told right. it, right? We can see it through right. her eyes. And then you can right. have that moment where, like, and also at some point, I explain what the hell she actually is like, what, how she is sort of like whatever she is. I don't even have a word. Like, she doesn't even have like a, a, oh, like she is like the chosen one or the, you know, <laughs> It's like what? What is she? I don't know, but yeah, I I I do that. Mm-hmm. And then in the second one, you could have a sort of thing where like then you start building on the world, or after you've sort of like built her and Monto as some sort of like, uh, I don't know, they have some sort of relationship. Yeah. Um, and then you have, and you've also grounded her in her world, right? Like that's what we focus on for the first one. So for the second one, we can have all the shiny fight sequences and all the colorful characters and, um. You know the Oracle yeah. woman who cut her eyes out. That was a very, <laughs> also a very random moment. I um, wasn't sure what yeah. was going on there with her. It's a metaphor. It's it's deep. You know, you know. yeah, it was too deep for me. <laughs> I'm more very, very deep, very deep. <laughs> it was as oh, deep yeah, as the I... river that uh, Susan was crossing. <laughs> I, I, I kind of just feel like they took the this took the sort of like uh, the separation of time, the wall of time. I feel like for these obvious, they kind of took that a little bit too seriously. I understand they wanted to make it a big deal, like you maybe cannot just simply cross over even though through power of will yes she can um but uh it is i feel like that kind of becomes a little bit of a hindrance as well it's like i feel like that separation of time needs to be a little less i guess so that she actually does get to experience that because i can understand you mommy some some guy who might as well have been something you dreamed up at a nightmare fucking studying for a test or something shows up and uh tells you to join him and no why who are you? And why are you telling me to call you king? And yeah, he's, like, he's like, just refer to me by my name, up. please. Yeah. Once and you do like, that, I can tell you everything. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, she's yeah, like, something. Huh? just give it something. But nah, 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 nah. Yeah. We're not. We're we're not doing any of that. And we're just going around. And then eventually, she sort of sort of decides that you know what, this is for our future. It's like how, in what way, yeah, there's, there's, these there's, things relate. Isn't it amazing that Mak- Mak- Makoto Shinkai turned this into your name, like twelve years <laughs> later? I, oh, man, I was gonna, I was gonna go there. You know, like l- l- lovers um, across a different, you know, space and time, right? Then that's, I guess, what you're going for. Although Munto does not have any interest in Yumemi past her <laughs> power, so like that. Um, but the thing I want to say that we're talking about is stakes. Stakes, right? Like, there's no, we don't know anything about why the worlds are separate or anything or, and, and everything you've said, Tori, is just like, we don't have any context for Yumemi doing what she's doing or what that means or, or if she wants to do it or not, or, you know, like, Mm. there's nothing there, like what she's sacrificing. And so there's no, there's no weight behind it. So the only thing is she was different. Yeah. She can see something that Clearly. no one else can see. She sees she is dead, different she sees from dead everyone people. else. <laughs> yeah. yeah, she sees dead people. Yeah, basically, and that that is basically it. And that's like, okay, sure, that's fine for like the introduction when you first see it. Like, okay, this one's special because she can see something that no one else can. But once we're past that, 
we need something else. There has to be something that clicks. Munto appearing before her is not really it, because again, it could literally just be a fever dream. And yeah, after that, it's just sort of stuff progresses as usual. We get the slice of life elements, we get the weird marriage story, we get stuff like that. And so, so, but so what? <laughs> exactly, <laughs> so, yeah. exactly. So, what I, I want to hit again what you said proof of concept. Like this to me, and I will explain Munto to you. Okay. So, this to me feels like Kigami had the fight sequence with the elves up in the sky and magic world. And like they wanted to show Kyoto Animation as a viable animation studio, maybe, or he just wanted to animate some fucking elves throwing laser beams at each other that, you know, whatever. And they did that. And then they were like, what else? You know, how can we contextualize this? It like grew from that first kind of wouldn't it be cool if fantasy battle happened in in space world? And and then we got to like make a graft almost. We have to forcibly put in other elements to make this an actual story. Yeah. Or it, it almost like two separate stories, like just getting mushed together. And uh, yeah. mm-hmm. which is like, I guess sort of how the whole thing sort of felt anyway. I, I did have this question. It's been burning my mind the whole fucking recording. I have to ask you guys now. We had it earlier on, the sort of the fun little game of trying to explain the plot. Uh, do you remember in, in the second OVA, there was a rock, okay? At a shrine, oh, yeah. there's this giant ass rock, yeah. right? And they're like, and it's I sort was of thinking like, about that. I'm like, what the fuck was up with the rock? Because uh, here's what I thought, right? I thought that the bad, the, the ship was the rock as in like it had somehow come back at the beginning of time was in stasis and then reawoke right because the guy said my god da, 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 they say the rock is from the future but then how is she contacting munto like or like reaching out to Mon- munto through the rock like what the fuck was with the rock because it was like it had this the big scene you know mm. like I, f- I felt like the whole setup of getting to work in the shrine and the and glasses boy was literally just there to introduce this rock that played like yeah. no fucking part in the conclusion of the the movie. Yeah, and- that was very weird because like to me I was like I didn't I understand where you come from with the the ship. A part of me was like in the other way it's like is it supposed to be like a gravestone? It's like is is Monto trapped under there or something like that? Is that the deal? What is going on here? And it's just is it a reference I'm not getting? Is it like a <laughs> cultural thing? Like yeah. I'm not understanding. Is it like I I feel like there's just I don't know. There is something missing here. It's so random. Yes, I understand it's a sp- spiritual rock from the future, but it, like you're telling me, it could it could have been any rock whatsoever. Yeah. And that it's would imp- that would imp- I guess that would imply that I guess the only thing you could say is like, well, that's proof that she can go between worlds. Like, sure, because that tech we we assume that rock came from Munto's future, right? Like, mm. oh man, I'm reading I way mean, too I guess, much. Right? I, 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 was, I, I got the fucking cork board up now, and I'm sort of like, like that guy from Oz, you know, <laughs> yeah, like, Charlie from Sunny. Yeah, like, I don't know. I was just trying. I was trying really hard to like make this work in my mind because I was like, you know, again, I was like, oh, if I fill in all the blanks, maybe there's like a cool thing here because I think I genuinely think this might have worked. Yes, um, that's what I want to say too. Yes, it could have been right. You can clearly see how it could have been. I I don't know. And and we go back to fixing Munto, but that this is something I was I feel passionately about. Like if you did give Munto and Yumemi a relationship, if you did do the necessary world building to make things interesting, if you did, like you said, you have to focalize it on Yumemi and and really. Um, show us the world through her thing instead of just exposition of the the elves. Maybe there could have been something here. There could have been a Shinkai esque experience. There could have been some even a Tenshi Muyo esque experience. There could have been something that became something that people cared about, and it wouldn't have taken that much work. Just just a, a decent writing. Uh, and editing pass, you know, series composition. And then we could have had a Munto future. Yeah, because we sat through, essentially, I believe we're talking about like an hour and maybe 40 plus minutes of actual, you know, uh, story um, through two, the combination of two OVAs, right? Get rid of the ending song and the credits. Like there's, a, there's enough time there to make 
something coherent, especially when you think about it. Like, here's the crazy, the crazy thing is like, they give us so much like politics and so much s- stuff, but very little actually happens. Yeah. The yeah. story, the story mm-hmm. is essentially, it's like two encounters, right? You have yep. the, um, the first time they sort of make contact and then when they reconnect, right. And there's sort of like this, like, um, in in the instance of the first one, it's like the collapse of these seven towers, right? So you're on a sort of a timer when they need to make the contact. And the second one is before um, this person, these um, spaceship guys um, hurt her feelings so much that she will become damaged. And then she will sort of like, it's almost like she can, she is like a physical manifestation of the universe. So if she becomes broken as an individual, then the universe is break. See, uh, if they did that, man, if you made that the central conceit of Munto, that her she's actually the embodiment of the magical world collapsing, and maybe you put a bunch of drama in Yumemi's life that she has to overcome. Yeah. And and like when the elves do good things to help the world, then it helps Yumemi's mental state and, and things like that. Yeah. I don't, and I'm you sure could have even been. tied the fucking swimming scene together now. Because that's like a yeah. big moment of affirmation yeah. for her, right? She right. learns to like believe and power through. And then yeah. of course that has a positive effect on the universe. Ah, uh, but like that's that's they didn't sort of semi coherent <laughs> storytelling, right? Like <laughs> Yeah, they sure didn't do what that. We, yeah. Like I, I hear I hear what you're saying there, but how about five minutes of exposition over a still shot of Munto <laughs> looking pensive? Of all these proper nouns of, of people of places we're never gonna care about yeah. and aren't gonna matter. Yes. I was kinda yeah. wondering that. I was like, Oh, it, he must have a book somewhere, right? Yeah. Like he, he <laughs> yeah. must have some it's sort of fan fiction, right? Oh my fan fiction. I, I genuinely, oh. I, I, a part of me is like a very cu- morbidly curious about how, um, how the, um, the, the series went, because uh, oh, the uh, I think it's a retelling of the second one. I think yeah, it doesn't you, present any new info, but I'm not. Yeah, sure. but with twelve episodes, though, you feel like it, they'd have to like fill in a lot of the gaps, right? Because this it feels like a series of moments punctuated by nothing, yeah. where. You know, you might have got like, you know, you might have got like, oh, nine episodes. You might have got like, with nine episodes, you theoretically could have really like fleshed out what we did get. Now, what we got, you know, in terms of like the first third might have been, I guess, theoretically might have been like the war, the civil war. What was going on? Was it a civil war? Between the, the uh, oh boy, fantasy that's, race, that's a good question. <laughs> uh, so I, I checked it. Uh, episodes one through six of the Munto OVA from two thousand nine are restored identical scenes from the both ovas oh so, so there just, are three oh, episodes okay. of additional content that, <laughs> that might make sense because the ending was i oh, it was a cliffhanger oh my god oh like what we did what what are we doing here guys i, I like i barely gave a fuck but i did give a, a fuck and when you end it on like uh the inception spinning thing you know but at least in that case you have an option either it stopped and he is like in the fact he's in the dream or it doesn't stop and he or whatever, whatever. you know like there's it's right, only right, two right. options here it's like all right and now the story begins the exactly <laughs> exactly exactly and and so that that segues right into what i want to talk about here and you know we kind of touched on it before but like Munto failed. It's it's an abject failure. I, I have no idea how it got a second OVA. Maybe they wanted to give it that that shows, you know, how much they value Kigami. He's even, a really talented animator. <laughs> oh, he's great. He's he's so good. And, and he also in doing research, I did um, a eulogy video for the people that worked on disappearance that who passed away. And everything I've said when I was research or everything I read when researching for that was that Kigami just was so good at showing the other animators what to do and how to do it. And, you know, being the like head animator at Kyoto animation. And, uh, he was respected by everybody. So, um, I can see why they would trust in him. Right. But like, there's this thing like we talked about with kill a kill, right? Like if you can get that one IP under your belt that you own, that you don't have to, because after this, Kyoto Animation would become popular for working on stuff that either Katakawa or some big giant amorphous company, evil company owns, and they have to split the profits with and they have to use. Now, that's upsetting to you, obviously, as a studio because you want to own your IP and you want to get all of that. So you're not beholden to any, you know anybody aside from the the people internal to your company unfortunately 
the um, situation was that they did not hit a success with their original IPs. What hit was the melancholy of Haruhi Suzumiya and Clanet, and those, of course, not original works. And I think there's a reason for that, right? And I I, I feel bad, you know, like shitting on Kigami, especially because he's no longer with us too. But like the novels of the melancholy of Haruhi Suzumiya, the original work that was there when Kyoto Animation stepped in and created that anime to promote that, those novels are fantastic. They are genuinely good storytelling. And I feel that way for so many of the IPs that uh, get produced and, and that Kyoto Animation took and they made, they identified what was great about Haruhi Suzumiya and they put that on screen and they translated that accurately, but they didn't come up with it, you know? And there's a huge, huge, like, and I think Munto shows us this, this chasm of difference between owning something or like creating the conceit and the storytelling behind it and then making a damn good fight scene or a damn good emotional moment or showcasing a character's inner turmoil on screen in a visual narrative medium. And that that's where that's where Munto lives, right? That's the Munto. You know what? The, uh, it's kind of weird parallels to like what Imaishi was doing towards the end of Gainax and going into Trigger. Yeah. And you kind of like, I think he doesn't suffer the same way uh, Kill a Kill does not suffer the same way that this does, but I always felt like Imaishi was sort of like an exceptionally talented animator and a fairly good storyteller who kind yeah. of just like, and in this case, it's sort of the same thing. He's an exceptionally good animator and he's got a story to tell. Yeah. But yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. you just, it, it's just one of those things where it's like almost like having some sort of direct, like somebody else to just sort of like, to like compose the series right because this is what, what great man with uh, yeah. amamiya right he get, he had ha i got the idea right but i'm going to give it to you and you're going to you're going to put this into like a a coherent you know exactly thing. hire uh, a writer people and, yeah. and this is what i think too about um but the 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 desire for the studio to own this ip uh i see it so much in anime you know i the one i want to bring up is studio three hertz I don't know if you know this studio, yeah. but they they did Flip Flappers and they did Princess Principal, which are both these uh, kind did, of ori- – huh? Have they got – are they doing um, Do It Yourself right now? Oh, I don't know if that's them. I don't know. We got to fact check that. But uh, I know that they were founded on uh, – because I love Do It Yourself. That's my anime of the year so far. Um, they were founded on the basis or the idea that they want to do original anime and they are, they are doing everything they can to make their original anime. And then they did, they also did like sword art online gun Gale online uh, to pay the fucking bills. And I think you see that again and again, right? Like mm. uh, in Cloverworks, right? They did promise Neverland. They cranked out 12 episodes of promise lever Neverland. And they ended that right. It was their contract was up. And then they went, but they really want to do, they want to work themselves to death on Wonder Egg priority. You know, Every, nobody wants to do the adaptation, even, even trigger, you know, I, I think that, they're doing a better job of it with um, cyberpunk edge runners and, and getting that Netflix and uh, uh, CD project red money. But at the end of the day, I think everybody wants to tell their own story. Absolutely. And yeah. If, if you can do that in a financially solvent way, that's the goal. Hmm. Yeah. Unfortunately, generally how you get financially solvent is uh to uh you know just don't pay the people that you're uh working who are working <laughs> yeah, for you yeah. or in the affordable version just don't pay your taxes <laughs> which uh, is always popular <laughs> Uh, oh, I, I, I just for the record a quick fact check because uh, you know mistakes have been made in terms of facts that have been said but especially by me on the podcast before um three hearts did not do do yourself i don't know why i, I had that in my mind i was kind of like perusing three hertz recently and i was also perusing do it yourself and i guess i sort of amalgamated them into yeah. uh a, a spurious fact that's not in fact true but yeah do it yourself trey bon um, so, so oh 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 i'm gonna keep going on this one last thing remember we were talking early early kyoto animation now but kyoto animation never got away from that 
you remember they they did this big thing, and I think it was around Violet Evergarden of like the story contest, and that they they were high, they were like, we got to get people who will give us a good story, and then we'll make it into an anime, and we'll own it. Yeah. You know, and they we, always and we'll had this own it. <laughs> yeah, as they yeah, yeah. as they run, right, they rifle their fingertips together and sort of like cackle in the background. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And yeah, apparently, they've been burned by the the relationship they had with using other people's works. I, otherwise, why would you do it? Um, that that's but, yeah. oh man i could there's a, such a horribly horribly inoffensive inoff- joke to be made there by the way um okay oh oh god i use the word burn oh, and you said it was i wasn't the guy's motivation Fuck. that he believed that he was sort of like the creator of was didn't he believe they stole his idea oh right yeah for he became euphonium then oh fuck yeah. yo we got dark oof we did In- inadvertently <laughs> but oh then, no. then, very, then very much vertently <laughs> <laughs> yeah oh man now i'm sad uh, uh the i liked a little elf girl there we go on a side note just to move us away from the darkness uh, oh yeah yeah I, I, I was like i don't know what weird relationship was going on between her and guy gus um uh, it was like <laughs> oh gus also voiced by dan green of uh yami yugi fame in the english dub that's the that's the cool thing about back then back then and never you know it, again, this, this, the halcyon days there's like yeah. four there's like four vas there's just sort of like yeah. in between <laughs> things you're like oh you like that person they do everything it's yeah. like like oh you like john michael tatum yeah he's in everything <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. How do you, what about john young bosch you like john yeah. young bosch yeah, yeah, yeah. okay he's, yeah. He's, i think he's isn't he, isn't he he's he is officially so, yeah. though like in everything right johnny and bosch uh, oh yeah oh vash the stampede I, I wonder if he's doing it i wonder if he's reprising it for the new trigun movie. he uh he he pissed me off though a few years ago um, what happened? uh he got he so i'm i generally what i do is i'll watch an anime in sub and if i really like it i'll watch it again the dub um, oh, okay. just to like experience it again and i'm always kind of yeah. morbidly curious about how they do it right because you get this idea, like you get this big performance, or and they, let's see how we change it and like how what we bring to it, right? So, uh, Zombie Land Saga, hey, uh, fucking, uh, who's my boy? Uh, who played? Oh shit, I can't remember. Mauro Romiano, right? Mauro yeah, Romiano yeah, yeah. absolutely yeah. kills it. Yeah. And then the dub right. comes out, and guess who's doing uh, Mauro Romiano's part? It's John Gumbash. And is I was it like, really? Yeah, I didn't even know. And that. I was like, ooh, this is going to be interesting. Uh, yeah, turns no, out. He, he, Turns yeah. out Mamoriano carried a lot of what was yes. great about that character. <laughs> yes, yes, and it Kataro, did not uh, translate. I will, I will defend Johnny Young Bosch's honor. Uh, since we're talking about Kyoto Animation, uh, he does uh, Koizumi in Haruhi and nails, nails the role. Loved it. Uh, he's he's great. Like he's, I I would say outside of um, what's the dude who does uh, the vampire, the vampire with a gun, Tr- Helsing guy. Oh, um, Helsing, yeah, yeah, Helsing. That, yeah. The guy who does that, he's like he's a really famous VA, or like for the in, in the English dub market. Uh, um, I've never even seen oh, Helsing. You guys got to tell he's, me. He's in Come a lot. He's research. in a lot of stuff. He's like Itachi in Naruto as well. He's like he does a lot of shit. He's big name. But uh, outside of that guy, Johnny Umbosh is like one of my favorites in the uh, on the English side of things. Oh, it's gonna bother me now. What his name is. Because he's like uh, Chris, oh, Chris Freeman. Chris Freeman. Oh, yeah. Shall I, yeah. Speaking of the melancholy of horror, he sues me. Yeah. He is, sure. isn't he? Like, isn't he like the mate? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> Chris but Freeman's great, man. He's he's yeah. Woo. He's just got he's got a he's got a he's got a beautiful voice. I gotta say, yeah, he's got a beautiful voice. <laughs> Very attractive voice, but he does. Um, he takes it seriously too. Check out his podcast on voice acting. Yeah, he's got a podcast. Of, oh, okay. oh man, he's he's into it. He how, he, how, he interviews other voice actors. Oh, how so is good. he not on Critical Role? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I'm sure he's interviewed Matthew Mercer on his podcast. I oh, he must have. He must have. Yeah. Like yeah, every, and we all love Matthew Mercer. Matthew Mercer. Yeah. Levi Ackerman, right? Isn't that his big role in terms of anime? Which is oh, a, I don't. That's a big role. Titans. You didn't watch Attack on Titan? Not I mean, the, I did. I had not to. The time, but... not the time. Uh, but Munto, so um, do we want to ra- we want to rate Munto, or do we want to talk about anything right. else? Uh, what do we got to do? Oh, we got to do um, recommendations, recommendations, okay. and a rating. Okay, so um, I uh, recommendations. Uh. <laughs> yeah, give me give me some of those old OVAs from the that you said, Bag. And you know, Tori, what have you? You must have seen something that looked at least like Munto. Like a better version of Monto. 
<laughs> yeah, please. Ideally better because oh we're recommending it. God. Are you thinking about I don't, that? Think about that, Tori. Yeah. You got you got two minutes. <laughs> Kai? <laughs> <laughs> I will I will go, like I said, with um Tenchi Muyo. It gives me the same vibes, especially some of the expended universe. Like this is the promise. The promise given by Munto or the expectations given by Munto are then fulfilled in something like Tenchi Universe or or GXP to a lesser extent. Uh and even the the original OVA of Tenchi Muyo is just what I imagine this would be, but better. So that's my recommendation. I'm gonna go for Castle in the Sky. Yep. yep. Uh, yeah. That do do with that what you will. I there's there's parallels. Castles in the sky. <laughs> it's not just the name. <laughs> there's like, you know, there's a lost confusing timeline. It's better. Um also record of Lotus War. Why not? It's the only fantasy yeah. OVA that I really think that's sort of like fantasy enough oh. to match this i'll throw in there i'll throw in there escaflone oh yeah, yeah of I course that's the, that's the isekai you're looking for sorry <laughs> uh, so i was All trying right. to go through some stuff and trying to the thing is i can't the problem with recommending especially going into OVAs, is the fact that i can't really recall anything that i would compare to Munto to like specifically and when I do it is for very weak reasons and they aren't very good so we sort of come back to the same thing it's like I, I could easily just say you know you want to watch something else that is a passion project uh, yes <laughs> go, go watch go, go. Twinkle Nora Rock Me or go watch Nora and then watch Twinkle Nora Rock Me no it is absolutely garbage don't watch it but like I mean it's a passion project You'll get to see why you'll you can see if you can understand why the director of that decided to put himself in the OVA literally, and why he decided to you know why he was so into it that he literally hired a uh, a cosplayer to uh, cosplay Nora and uh, ride around on his motorbike for an entire day. So you know, so, out of that. curiosity, when you say he literally put himself into it, like did he draw himself in, or is it just randomly like a, like a guy walks on over the animation at one point? He is an in Nora Twinkle Nora Rockman. He's an actual character. He is a midget that uh, sort of walks around and interacts with Nora and tries to help her. And they even have a little dance scene together. Very very like one frame a second <laughs> animated oh, dance, boy. terrible. But <laughs> okay, because we're floundering with the. Um recommendations i got a fun alternative if someone goes here you go here's the money here's the animators what passion project would you like to make now you don't have to get too specific details but like if you could just go oh you know something Mm. in this space oh that's a good question i have an immediate response i have always wanted to do are you familiar with gako garashi uh where it's the um it's like this uh, school, innocent school slice of life thing, and then you find out it's oh. a horror thing at the end of the first episode, and it's like a zombie thing. No. I have always cool, wanted, yeah, I have always wanted to make a a show that transforms midway through, or that starts off with the premise of like this show is going to be whatever you know. It doesn't even matter what the genre is, but then it becomes either like a big swing or gradually becomes something completely different. And the only thing I've seen that's even close to this is Die Buster, which is kind of fun and rompy in the beginning three episodes. And then the next three episodes are all like this, like really dark introspective, like uh, plot BS. And uh, <laughs> yeah, so I want to, I want to do that. I want a big twist uh, in, in terms of genre midway through. What about, um, Higurashi. That's sort of in that space. Fuck Higurashi. Yeah, you're mm-hmm. right. That that kind of is that. I, like, right? uh, I was I thinking Doki Higurashi. Doki Literature Club for some yeah, reason. It was right, like, you know, right, but the right, anime. Right. But yeah. the, those are those feel so contrived. I, I think I think more in the vein of like a space dandy, right? Like just every every time you come in and you boot it up, you're like, I don't know what I'm gonna get. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah, that's that would be cool. Tori, if they, they're giving you the monies. What are you making? I I don't even know. Like maybe it's just because it's literally on my mind, but I mean it wouldn't even necessarily be just for the anime. It would be to 
pay somebody to get off his ass and keep ri- keep riding it as well. Like we recently on the podcast, we went through Black Lagoon, and that just reminded me of how much more I want more of that. So yeah, given uh, the yeah. limited money, I would I would you, fucking have somebody get that guy and just make him write more, so you, they can make more uh, more Black Lagoon. You kind of stole my answer. I was going to go land in the Lustre season two. But... Oh yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what? yeah. Oh, if we're That's talking it. about this, then yeah, I can hit you with like the other Haruhi novels, the Spice and Wolf, you know, season two. I would I like Wonder Egg priority is just plain not finished i want somebody to finish it you know uh yeah but if, if i can if i can make my own one i was thinking like sort of like magical girls but in like a high fantasy setting Ooh, that's what i that's what that's i want yeah. that's what i want uh, i think that would be like mm-hmm. quite like because you know they, like oh it's it doesn't need to subvert it no maho shoujo like nightmare stuff you know like yeah, we've done yeah. that and they've done it better than i ever could right Right, right, right. You know, but just having it sort of thing where it's like, okay, what if uh, what if the dragon slayers are magical girls, for example, right? Or the demon slayers are magical girls, right? Yeah. What what's yeah, that yeah, look yeah. like? You know? Yeah. Um, I'm excited. Yeah. I guess I guess it kind of a sort of semi equivalent would be sort of suke suke, which is the um um oh it's got the most absurdly long night novel light novel title. It got one season, it was kind of poor. What was it called? It's like it's an absurdly long title, which you know as all good light novels are um it, oh, from, what was it at the, something about the world at this corner of the world or i don't know it's that's what i always thought i always I like know. if i could if i could make it i'd like to make it if i had the passion project green light that's what i would do um you, you oh, wait, i got it. it okay suke suke what are you doing at the end of the world are you busy can you save me oh that one yeah oh, i, I, I like that one i like it. i like that one yeah. <laughs> it's it's like uh, it's kind of cool actually it's weirdly parallels with this one like it's in the future there's like floating islands and then at the surface level instead of like our world there's like just monsters and these magical girls go down and they just like destroy the monsters but there's like a sort of ticking clock on their existence sure um, sure Apparently the light oh, novels are good. Yeah. Apparently the light novels yeah. are good because the anime wasn't that. that great. Yeah. But I liked it because again, it's it's sort of in I, my you know do, fantasy do you sort know, of wheelhouse. Do you know what would be my pop off moment? My my uh, hyper poggers moment. Uh, this is something that I've always wanted to do. Like, imagine you make an original anime or something, and it's like whatever a magical girl show, and you do your own whatever and then in the very last episode something comes in that you know like Madokami comes down and you realize you've been watching a madoka magica show the entire time or or like something like that you know like it It ties into it would literally i just it would have to be uh dio from jojo's bizarre adventure just for the meme (laughs) at the very (laughs) end it was me yeah 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 yeah. that would be it right or or like you're you're like damn the main character's name was jojo the entire time how did i not notice you know the whole thing was a reference yeah 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 yeah, exactly it's pretty far to go for a meme but i i like (laughs) it It would be so good, wouldn't it? It would be so good. And you like you don't you don't give anything ahead of time. You don't like give any in the credits. You don't credit Anaplex or anybody. You know yeah. that would be a, yeah. that would be a fucking moment. <laughs> like yeah. if you could keep that under wraps just for yeah. that moment, you know. Yep. yep. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we struggled on the recommendations, but there we go. We had a JoJo reference. <laughs> so we pulled it back <laughs> uh, Jojo X Munto that's what I'm funding so Tori what we do at this, uh, at this point is at the, at the end of the episode we always um, we have this like Kyo Annie big board we sort of give a letter grading like A, B, C, T T <laughs> D, D. sure. Uh, T. <laughs> Nothing's been in the T rankings yet. No. Dango, hopefully, we won't get down there. Maybe Miriam. It's Myriad like Icky Toast and in high school, the dad is down in the T section. <laughs> it's like high school, the dad. <laughs> yeah, it's fun, but it's a T, right? Oh, were you saying? Were you saying that was a joke? Oh, that's a booby joke. It was a booby joke. Uh, yeah. Okay, oh, I missed it. Damn. Ah, booby jokes. We'll save that for next week because there's a there's a very famous scene. <laughs> oh yeah. yeah. Yes, poopy jokes for next week. Um, <laughs> what happened, Kyoto Animation? So it's a classic <laughs> tier maker list, right? S tier, A, B, C, D, E, F. You go all the way. You can go down to Z if you want. Um, and we've been rating the uh, the Kyo Ani shows on it. So we've had Clan Ad. We said it was a B tier show. 
A, mm-hmm. B. Like we're gonna make we're gonna make a list. I actually we do. Go we literally make a list. Tier list maker because I'm forgetting what we ranked everything now. Yeah, Sandy Funny was uh was top tier, and then yeah, it was yeah, like yeah. But what a rung below that was Clan Ads, and we think we said Free was like a rung below that next to Tamako Market. Clan Ad and Free on the A tier. I f- okay. I think Free was like high B, and then like Tamako Market was like we agreed yeah. to let us have it on the B, even though we didn't really want it on the B. Right. Okay. 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 But some of us really wanted it on the B. Um, yeah. And now here we are <laughs> at Monto, and for me, there's no fucking way this is a B. No. Yeah. Uh, I I would agree. I think, yeah, I'll get it. Though. I think it's a strong D. Wow. Oh, jeez. Okay. Is that too yeah. harsh? I don't know. What do you think, Tori? Yeah, I was kind of uh, just sort of playing with the, <laughs> playing with the ranks in my in my head as well. I sort of, I think a D sounds all right, honestly. Jeez. Not- I did. I was D sounds to be like you should avoid this, or like I was offended in some way by this, which wasn't really the case for me for Munto. I mean, I was offended at the exposition, yes, and for <laughs> a couple other things. The, the ending, building. the ending. Yeah, sure, sure. The 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 seri- the composition of the entire <laughs> thing, absolutely. Uh, that that little girl's whole existence. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. Okay, Superman. maybe it is a D. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, I, I there's too much that I like about Munto that I I don't want to I don't want to uh, okay I think there's if there's tiers below D then I can accept D. oh yeah like there's okay. there's we say E and F right well F for sure right okay we, you know right. um I would say D plus though like oh, or, yeah, yeah, yeah. or even even C minus I could be talking about C minus um that's fair because there's I said there's a lot of things that's that I fair. did actually kind of like I was you know um. It's just that there's no way, like there's no way you can c- turn around to someone with a straight face and say, "Oh yeah, this is good." Oh yeah, totally. <laughs> you know, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You're going to be watching QA anyway. Well, then you're starting off at Munto. <laughs> yeah. Oh no! <laughs> yeah, don't if, do the people. Yeah, like they did. Like someone's like someone turns around. I really, really like that Violet Evergarden. It's like, well, <laughs> that. <can't. laughs> do I know what you're watching next? Ah <laughs> uh, oh, man, that's it, right? That is Munto. Uh, yeah. I had a lot of fun with it. You know, yeah. I had more yeah. fun talking about it than I did ne- than I did watching it, which is not always <laughs> sure. the case, obviously. Um, but there was some beautiful moments speckled throughout. And again, I would say, you know, um, it's a must watch for uh, Kiyoani fans because it's so it's like it's a, it's you know, Clanad is and Haruhi are sort of like the foundational text. But you know, this is this is literally a foundational text. You know, timeline yeah. wise. Uh, and it's mm. fucking amazing to see to think to, to think. Sorry, there's Irish people don't pronounce ths, and I I'm very conscious of trying to not fall into that trap of thirty three and a third. To think that like three years after this, you know, we're going to be having like a, the melancholy. It's yep. amazing to see like where how far they came, um, yep. and yep. to see it's- like even just to hypothesize the alternative timeline. You know, that's yep. that's kind of fascinating to me too. Uh, a lot of fun with Monto. Don't regret picking it at all. It's variety is the spice exactly. of life, and this was definitely a different difference than like what you know. This it could this very easily could have been you know uh, K on or something like that, and we would have kind of regurgitated what we said about Naoki Yamada before. This is right. totally fresh, totally interesting. Tori, thanks for coming on, dude. It was awesome. Had a lot of fun. Thank you for having me. Um, you can check out Tori on the Red Leaf Retrocast. Link will be in the description below. And you can check out his YouTube channel, Anime Top Scholar, where he's going through Bleach. I am currently going through Bleach as one of the things, yes. Because now it's officially 20 years old, right? Is it that... is. I mean, we, we have the dates at the 15 years to the season, so oh, anything so inside of that is uh, okay. It's basically oh. considered retro by us. And since we are obviously the foremost authority on everything retro, then that's the rule. <laughs> yes. It's official. If you are 15 years old, you're retro. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> well, yeah. Thanks, everybody, for listening. And uh, be sure to turn in, tune in next episode as we journey into the realm of uh, Myriad Colors Phantom World. We're back to, be- back to back dimes here. Monto and Myriad <laughs> Colors Phantom World. <laughs> Mid- the mid-season slump. <laughs> <laughs> well it should be a fun one nonetheless so we look forward to you joining us uh on that episode and thank you for sticking through all of us talk about Munto. Bye.